we have this like inner strength, this emotional resilience. And we have to see that this chapter of our life sometimes is no longer meant for us. It's time for us to grow. It's time to evolve and start a life that is actually truly aligned to who we want to be. Welcome to Women Winning Divorce, the podcast helping successful women navigate divorce with dignity so you can protect yourself, your children, and your assets. I'm Heather Quick, founding attorney at Florida Women's Law Group, where women win at life. This week, we had Jan and Jillian Juhas on the show, and we had a great conversation about making choices based on values instead of emotions, how to become a boundary badass, and some really helpful tips for building and maintaining boundaries. I hope this episode is valuable to anyone who might be listening. Stay tuned for the full episode. Welcome to this week's episode of Women Winning Divorce. I'm Heather Quick, owner and attorney at Florida Women's Law Group. Today, we have Jan and Jillian Juhas joining us. They are twin sisters, relationship boundary and conflict resolution consultants, mediators, and co-authors of Boundary Badass. Today, you will learn how to set boundaries with your toxic co-parent, tips for co-parenting with a high conflict person, and Jan and Jillian's Boundary Badass method. Welcome to the show, Jan and Jillian. Thanks Thanks for for having having us. You guys are great. Oh my God, you're even in sync with your your voices. Um, Well, it is just so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. And you two have had quite the professional journey to where you are now. I would love it if you would share a little bit about how you got to where you are professionally. So it's a little bit of our personal story and also a professional story. Uh, She and I grew up in a rural farm town of 900, moved to a metropolitan city of 3 million and went through a huge culture shock process. And during that experience, we learned that we didn't have strong enough boundaries. And that process really opened our eyes to learning how to express ourselves, to be heard and understood and operating from a place of value rather than emotion. And that whole process um, inspired us also in regards to our professional journey. We volunteered at a crisis hotline where we volunteered to help teens who ran away from home. And for three years, um, that journey itself realized that that's where we kind of learned to mediate um, before we actually became professional mediators that inspired us to get our master's in marriage and family therapy. And then today we are family mediators and we are co-parenting coaches and we deal with high conflict course of control dynamics. Wow. Well, that is amazing. I, I think, well, let's just, you know, jump right in because this is going to be a great topic. I can already tell. So let's jump right in and, and talk about what is a boundary. So from our perspective, a boundary is about a relation, how to keep a relationship thriving and find those balances between differences and bridging that gap and finding a mutual ground that both people can live with and thrive in that dynamic. And so a lot of times when we're dealing with even someone who's toxic, we still have to find a way especially if they're a co-parent, we can't get rid of them out of our lives, but how do we find ways to make them very child-centered to also support that dynamic so the children get to thrive as well? So boundaries are all about understanding two perspectives and finding that mutual ground that both people can thrive from. And now are there different kinds of boundaries? Oh, yes. There's lots of different types of boundaries. So you might have personal boundaries for yourself, such as you don't allow your ex-partner to come over to your house anymore. That would be a personal boundary for your own safety. Or if you dealt with somebody who has um, more a, a high conflict physical violence, then that, again, you would have other boundaries in place in order to protect your safety. So those would be our personal boundaries. But then there's also emotional types of boundaries. There's professional boundaries, maybe with your clients or colleagues. There's um, time boundaries, intellectual boundaries. So there's all different types of boundaries that can really help us thrive in life in general. Oh, there's co-parenting boundaries, which I would say the primarily biggest ones are parent-child communication. Phone calls always seem to be a sore place that a lot of um, our clients experience or also dealing with just communication between the parents and parents. 
that communication and what that looks like? Um, yeah, I mean, I have so many questions, but I'm not going to get, I'm not going to jump too far ahead because let's just talk about why, why it is important to build boundaries. And so for a lot of our listeners, you know, this women winning divorce, you know, you're going through a divorce and obviously, you know, things are going to change. And then particularly when there are children and, and so, you know, obviously if you had boundaries before, maybe if you had none, like it's going to change a lot. And so why, why is that important to build those? Well, I think when you're going through that process, because you have to separate your life in order to actually work with someone who's toxic, you have to operate from a place of value and logic and not emotion. And so this allows you to basically, even if they like attack your character or create these false allegations, you're able to stay outside of those power struggle dynamics and come from a place of value and redirect the conversation back to the children. And so this allows you to stay in your place of power based on your value alignment, where you're no longer being triggered by someone's, you know, manipulative behaviors or tactics. Yeah, because the goal of the high conflict person is to emotionally trigger us because they play off of emotions in order to regain control. The more chaos they create, the more they can come in and try to control a scenario. But when you are centered in your value, you're less likely to be manipulated or controlled. Now, okay, and this feeds right into this, because what do you do when someone disrespects your boundaries? So when someone disrespects your boundary, the first step is to ask a discovery question, which is an open-ended question to gain farther insight into what may have led to that behavior. And so you want to address the behavior and not the person's personality or character. And so let's say you have a boundary of communication that you both agreed upon. Then you say, help me understand how come we're no longer agreeing to the communication boundary that was set. It appears that we've gotten off track. And so you're trying to get them to basically uncover as to why they're no longer honoring the boundary that you mutually agreed upon for that dynamic. All right. That's, boy, that does, that takes you, uh, you have to get out of the emotion, right? And be thinking through that and not reacting. Which can Correct. Just, it's about it's com- becomes more of a strategy process. So you have to be calm and centered because if we're in a heightened state of emotion, it's going to be very hard for us to ask discovery questions and put it back on the other person because we're basically trying to help them take accountability for their disrespectful behavior, mm, but in an indirect way. <laughs> right. Not in an attacking way. Uh Please explain, yeah, why we're no longer doing Yeah, that. you could even set a boundary in that moment, too, regarding the boundary that's been breached. So you could say, you know, it appears we've gotten off track regarding our communication boundary. I value consistency or I value collaboration. How can we get back on track and honor the original agreement we had together? Mm-hmm. Very nice. Very rational. Um, very good <laughs> advice. Now, let's talk about the boundary badass method. So the boundary badass method is ASAP. And the reason why we have this acronym is because you want to set a boundary as soon as it, as soon as it does occur, because if we wait a few days, the other person may not understand where you're coming from or be very confused about the importance of this boundary. So first, um, the A is to assess, and that's where we use our discovery questions. So you want to first gather farther insight to the disconnect or discord. That way you have all the details that you need prior to setting the boundary, which the next step is S, set a boundary. And you want to use the professional method, which we would say it seems or it appears, because we don't want to say I think or I feel with a high conflict co-parent, because then they're going to see it as a way to play on your emotions. emotions. And so co-parenting is more of a professional sort of language that we use when communicating with them. Yeah. So we want to be business-like, but then you would identify the value and then you would ask a discovery question at the end of that boundary based on the goal you're trying to achieve with them and try to keep that child centered. The more you take yourself out of the equation and take them out of the equation, the better off you're going to be at strategizing and getting the results that you would like to see. 
And so the next A is then you're going to agree to a mutually beneficial plan that best supports the children's needs. So you might require some negotiation using your discovery questions where you're going back and forth a little bit and trying to bridge that gap between the differences or getting to the root cause of the problem that is um, at the forefront. And then P is to proceed forward with accountability. So you've made this agreement, you're both so it's sort of like a provision in a, you know, a parenting plan. You're both in agreement and you're going to hold and stick to that boundary and move forward. Yeah, and I would imagine that many, many couples, you know, obviously we're talking, you know, the high conflict and the ones who tend to benefit most from parenting coordination and helping you with the co-parenting co communication, uh, that they would need help with this that not everybody can even do the boundary badass method by themselves or, or can they? But I, I mean, and I'm just speaking from my experience with clients and high conflict and they really need that third party to help them through this. Well, actually it depends if they want to learn the skills or not, because most of uh -huh. our clients that we work with, we will work with just um, one parent, usually the protective parent or the healthier co-parent. And we teach them all the skills and they are able to implement it on their own in order to manage the high conflict personality. Which, well, that's so helpful because you want to learn the skills because you have to co-parent. Yeah, you, you, you are in this situation. Yeah, you have anywhere from, you know, it could be 18 years if you're dealing with an infant, or it could be, you know, you have another like 10 years under your belt in terms of dealing with this person. Mm -hmm. So it's better to learn the skills so you can at least move on with your life in peace and not allow this person's um, emotional turmoil to be projected onto you the rest of your life. And also, too, if they do project, you know, false allegations or accusations, we have like one liners that we provide our clients to use to basically nip it in the butt and be done with it and not even mm -hmm. engage. So that way it doesn't turn into another toxic conversation. Yeah, and that is and those are great skills to teach because that sometimes, you know, I find is the hardest thing. And, and, you know, clients really understanding and, you know, we represent women only, but it's helping women like don't engage, right? Because when you, once you kind of get in the mud with them, like, it's just too hard to then get out um, if you do that. Yeah. So if it's something that they're personally doing, then yes, you just want to shut it down. If it's something in regards to the children, then usually we need to negotiate that solution and try to figure out what's going to work in the best interest of meeting the child's needs. So, yeah. It's a fine balance of knowing how you're going to approach the situation that you're being, you know, handed. I do think, yeah. though, sometimes it can be crucial to say, like, I disagree or with your, you know, this appears like miscommunication. Or I disagree with the false allegation, even if it's just one sentence mm -hmm. to show that you're not necessarily ignoring it or being silent because you don't want them to flip the script on you if you end up in the courtroom. Right, right. So you need to address it and, and acknowledge like this is not okay. I'm not agreeing to this. Correct. You know, so that way, way they don't say that you yeah, so they that way they don't say that you're neglecting or you're not meeting the child's needs because you didn't respond. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. seen that happen, unfortunately. Yeah, and there is, and you know, that brings me to a point which I'm certain that you have seen in um we had to, this was like through mediation, we've done it multiple times, where you have to create, you know, a boundary, uh, an expectation of response, right? That, you know, in many of um, the clients and, you know, their communication are um, assisted certainly by, you know, the family, our family wizard, talking parents, you know, where they have a, an app to use, but um, that we had to, either limit the number of times you can send messages and then set a reasonable expectation for a response. Um, you know, like, okay, I get 24 hours, right? I'm working. I am not going to be on this thing. You know, my working hours are eight to five. Maybe theirs are, you know, in the evening. So I'm not going to engage in constant in this communication or respond to you during those hours but I need 24 hours and, um, you know, I know that has been helpful because that was a way to like, look at all these messages I sent. And it's like, well, 
And then I've had, I've certainly had situations where um, the, uh, you know, our client or the other person, but then they just don't want to respond, right? Because they're like, they're just, this is stupid stuff. I don't want to, but then it, they go to the court and say, look, she won't communicate with me. Right. We don't want to stay silent um, or stonewall because sometimes when we do stay silent, then we are inadvertently agreeing to certain behavior or mm-hmm. certain um, statements that our co- co-parent might have made. Um, we actually even do a response time even longer so that for non-emergency communication, such as 48 hours to 72 hours to reduce the amount of back and forth, because the more we communicate with a high conflict personality, the more it amplifies that connection to them. So we try to do, try to create, and we put this in our parenting plans as well, that it's a 48 hour, 72 hour non-emergency time response. And we try to help co-parents establish communication days, such as Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday, or every Tuesday, Thursday, so that they can live their life. And then those are the only days they have to communicate with their co-parent. And that becomes like the boundary. So they have a peace of mind in terms of raising their children also. And we're not having to engage with this high conflict personality on a day-to-day basis. um, I haven't, I don't think I've seen that, but it's a great idea. Like just even limiting the days. So that, yeah, you just have, you can have a break. Yeah, I think it helps so people can focus on, have their own peace of mind from this personality. Otherwise that, the personality that's high conflict, I mean, they will emotionally flood their co-parent and they, they could send, you know, multiple messages a day in, in order to provoke the other parent. And so this helps the protective or healthy parent Um, create that safe space for themselves so they don't have to constantly keep checking these messages because then we still get we're still in that toxic trauma bond type of pattern where we're constantly having to be at the beck and call of this emotional or egotistical personality that is intentionally trying to gain control over us because they try to gain control still through the communication and I think too in regards to that, a lot of times whenever we create these communication guidelines or provisions, it allows the other person not to, the high conflict, not to like have parental inter- interference because often they will try to message during the other co-parent's time just so that they can basically make them almost have to like respond when it's during their parenting time or vacations is another big one. They try to always you know interrupt people's vacation time with their children because they just want to create chaos and make it about themselves. Those are really good points. I know our listeners are, are going to be identified with a lot of that um, because it does happen. And, and I think you see the same types of patterns with the high conflict and trying to create that emotional chaos. Um, they, they do the same things, uh, even though yeah. different <laughs> people, very, they do. It's very textbook. It's like you could almost copy and paste you know, most of their messages or their style of communication across the board. Now, you two teach often about using your personal value system rather than emotions to set boundaries. Could you uh, unpack that a little bit for us? So yes, when it comes to setting boundaries, a lot of times I think people get stuck in the kind of this old mindset of setting ultimatums, such as if you don't do, if you do X, then I'm going to do Y. And so when we do that, we're actually creating a roadblock and a greater disconnect or a threat within the connection, which is not going to be met. And so when we are feeling emotional triggered, whether it's we're feeling disrespected, ignored, dismissed, whatever that emotional trigger is, that is insight into the uh, boundary we need to set. So the opposite of the emotional trigger we are experiencing, the opposite of that is the value that we need to set the boundary on. So for example, if we're feeling dismissed or ignored, then we might need to set a boundary on communication. If we're feeling disrespected, then we might need to set a boundary on mutual respect. So that emotional trigger that we're experiencing is a deeper cue to where the boundary needs to be set because the value actually meets our emotional need on a deeper level, but we're coming from a very logical place because values are universally understood where emotions are one-sided perspectives and not always understood. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and then by setting the boundaries, then you are 
removing a lot of that emotional response. Right. right. And we're staying in our our own internal power of integrity rather than fueling the fire that this high conflict person wants to create. Yes, yeah, so we want to use I statements and we statements versus you statements because you statements is very common to be very accusatory or, you know, you're such a whatever or you're not even listening. Like that doesn't actually allow us to make progress or be able to resolve the differences. Instead, we need to say I this or it appears you can also depersonalize it and then i value and using the i value it's like such a game changer for most of our clients wow okay okay i like that now um now we talked i talked about this a little bit before you know when you're at in a divorce at the point of the divorce you know maybe you didn't even have boundaries or they've changed and um you know, within a relationship or they've broken down, why, why do we let our boundaries erode? Well, I think a lot of times if we don't maintain or sustain our boundaries is because we're not believing in our self-worth. We're actually not valuing ourselves or perhaps during our own personal childhood, we didn't have a voice or we always had to appease our parents because we were silenced or we just had to do as they said, not as what we felt felt good to ourselves. And so when we're in that fond trauma response, which is people pleasing, a lot of times we feel like we always have to meet the other person's needs. And so we neglect ourselves in that process. And so we have to take ourselves out of that power dynamic, heal our childhood wounds, and then be able to show up and know that our boundaries are to also honor and respect and advocate for our children. Because if we don't speak up, then our children are also going to end up experiencing those generational patterns as well. And they don't have the voice to advocate for themselves. Yeah, that um, makes a lot of sense. Now, how do you manage the fear of setting boundaries, maybe either during or after the divorce process? So when it comes to fear, if we're operating from a place of fear, we're operating from a place of trying to control the atmosphere or the other person. And so the fear is the opposite of where we want to operate from. It's operating from a place of emotion or we're in our state of our ego. Instead, we want to be in our heart-centered thinking, which is where our value system comes into place. Your value system becomes your roadmap of operation. So when you're in alignment with your value system, your inner voice becomes stronger. And we recommend choosing your top five uh, co-parenting values that you want to operate by on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can even do value statements every single day in order to strengthen your inner voice, such as, you know, I value communication. I let my co-parent know that the children have um, soccer practice every Wednesday and every Friday. because I, And so you're creating these value statements on a day-to-day -day basis to prove to yourself, to create self-trust, that you're in alignment with your truth. Okay. So those okay. values override any sort of fears because you are creating your own uh, personal alignment. I think it's also important that we nurture the relationship with ourselves too and have a daily self-care, self-love routine because if we're not nurturing that relationship with ourselves, it's going to be hard to even find that voice within ourselves because that means we're neglecting and abandoning our inner truth. And if we abandon ourselves, then how can we have our needs met with other people? Because then they're going to abandon us as well or neglect or reject or whatever it may be going back to all those childhood wounds. And so when we take care of ourselves, it's much easier to show up and not have those fears sort of override our thought process, but we're able to actually manage them in a way because we believe that we deserve to be treated with respect. So, and this sounds like a lot, you know, um, well, very therapeutic, right? Because uh, these things come from our past and how we show up probably and how we're going to respond to a high conflict person um, that a lot of, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's helpful to do the work to allow you to have effective communication and effectively raise your child with, you know, your ex spouse. 
Yeah, it's going to, anytime someone does the work, um, that self-awareness becomes your place of power, whether it's with raising your children, whether it's in your work life, whether it's in a new marital relationship. So this work that you're going to do is going to benefit you in all aspects of life. And the more, like I said, the more self-awareness we have, the more clarity we have in order to meet our own needs and find inner peace. It's getting to a place of emotional freedom. And I think too, like if you're not going to help yourself, then who is going to help you? Because if you, you have to be able to want to, you know, find a solution because people aren't just going to drop it in your lap. So in a way, a lot of times with the coaching process, it becomes a very, um, interactive process but at the same time you feel empowered to want to speak up you feel empowered to take action because we're very solution focused so as much as we're understanding our emotions we're actually putting this in implementing and putting it into play in real life and not just talking about it but we're actually doing something in order to see the results take place and the high conflict co-parent 11 out of 10 times is not going to self-reflect or do the work to heal because they operate from fear and control. And that's how they create the chaos in order to come in and disrupt dynamics. And so your power to heal helps you say three steps ahead of them in terms of strategy. Well, and that that's really important because that in and of itself, if you can do the work and set the boundaries, you're just going to have more peace because you're going to not get drawn in right to that chaos and that conflict that's just, you know, always there. And they're always trying to, you know, push your buttons. Well, that's the thing too. Like we want to change the communication pattern because if we keep operating the way that the couple operated or the mayor, you know, during the marriage, then we're going to constantly just be repeating the same type of communication style with that person. So if we want to see change, then we have to change the way we communicate. And that means changing the way that we, you know, are articulate. So we have to be assertive. We can't be passive. We can't be aggressive. We want to be assertive. So we're heard and understood. And almost dry and boring. It becomes a very business-like conversations in regards to co-parenting communication. Yeah, and I... um but I can see how that works. And just, and like you were talking about the language in and of itself, it matters and it can make a big difference in, in how you communicate with your, the high conflict co-parent, um, you know, because very often I know, you know, through our, my experiences, um, you know, with, with clients that we then, you know, try to get to co-parenting high conflict resolutions, it, it is. It's just like this cycle, continual, and it, they have a hard time breaking it. Or and usually the things they're doing to that they think set boundaries are like the things that you said in the beginning. They're they're just either ignoring or you know responding in ways that just continue to um, increase the conflict. Yes. So that's why, you know, it does, it is a transformation process to learn, but I would say most of our clients are able, they start to see the results within, you know, a month of working together, you know, and then by three months, six months, depending on their case, you know, it can be, you know, they, they have all the skills and tools that they need to be able to navigate this. Now they're always, you know, sometimes they'll come back if they have to end up back in court, things of that nature, which, you know, is all out of their control. But most mm -hmm. of the time they know how to write their messages. And a lot of times we're just editing or tweaking little things here and there, but they have the skills and the tools, which allows them to like feel powerful in their own life, just by being able to communicate in a way that feels good to them. And they become better negotiators for when they go into mediation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see that for sure. Now, um, do you, I would imagine that, you know, when, you know, your clients, they learn how to communicate and they learn how to set boundaries can also be very helpful for their children because their children can see how they're setting boundaries because the children may need to do that as well with that parent and, 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 and understand even what these boundaries are. Do you yes, find we that? Do. 
Yeah, we do work from a holistic perspective when it comes to coaching. And we do help the parents, help the children advocate for themselves and develop their inner voice because our inner voice is developed from infancy to about age seven. And so that's our prime time to really learn um, our self-worth in setting those boundaries of what feels good to us and what doesn't feel good to us. So yes, we really do help um, parents advocate or teach their children boundaries as well. Yeah, and I think too, like we'll provide, by, you know, workbook. We also have a chapter in our book dedicated to children boundaries. So children, the learn the sooner they learn to advocate and know, and I mean, obviously theirs is going to be a little bit different. It's like a one-liner that they use, but the sooner they learn those boundaries, the better off they're going to be in all of their friendships and their relationships and what they go through, because nowhere in life do we really learn communication skills in school. And so the sooner you, we teach our children, the better off they're going to be for that next generation. But then they also feel like they can speak up when they're dealing with something that doesn't feel good. So they may say, if mom or dad is talking about the co-parent, they may say, you know, this sounds like an adult conversation and I'm a kid. I don't want to be a part of this. And just teaching them those basic one-liners is so helpful. Mm -hmm. That's, um, yeah, I can see that being very helpful. And again, giving them, like st like you said, standing in their power and, and recognizing, like, I don't want to be in that situation um, and how, how they can voice that um, for them. Now, which I think that kind of just answered it, but, um, you know, how do you stand strongly in your boundaries? Like, because over time, you know, I mean, I know that the high conflict parent, um, they, they kind of always are. So um, do you find that, um, you know, women find it difficult or what, what things do you do to help them stay strong in their boundaries? Yeah, so the high conflict co-parent is definitely going to push buttons because they don't like boundaries. They don't like someone putting they'll view it as a restriction when really it's all about collaboration and creating um, a sense of stability and consistency within the dynamic, just like you might have in a business relationship or even in a friendship. There's always a certain level of consistency and a certain level of you know, clarity in order to create effective uh, foundation to operate from. And yeah, so really staying strong in your boundaries really comes down to believing in yourself and your self-worth and holding the line. Um, of course, boundaries can always be renegotiated as well. It doesn't mean that they're like always going to be, for example, you might hold that boundary where your ex is not allowed in your house. That might be what's a non-negotiable. You're not going to change your opinion about that, but you might renegotiate boundaries in regards to communication days. Say they got a new job and now you need to switch to different days rather than Monday, Wednesday. Um, you switch into, you know, every Thursday and Monday instead or something. So they can be renegotiated, but you're still sticking to that boundary and the sense of transparency of you're creating this kind of like business agreement and how you operate. Now, you two have shared on other podcasts that creating boundaries is a collaborative process. Can you share a little bit more about that? So... It's a clouder process because we're trying to take each person's perspective and find a middle ground that both people can live with. And so even if we're on opposite ends of the spectrum, each person may need to compromise in such some such way that's going to meet the child's needs. And so we have to always position it back to how is this benefiting the child? What is the child gaining from this? And when we do that, that's where we're using our discovery questions. But it's collaborative because each person needs to have a voice in order for that boundary to even work. And if only one person is trying to set a unilateral boundary or ultimatum, it's not going to work, especially with a high conflict person. And so both people have to have a voice for it to be agreeable and for both people to want to actually, you know, thrive in a way that allows them to negotiate, but also in a respectful manner. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's really helpful because having this conversation with you, I, I can see where, well, and one, you know, if the court orders you, you know, you know, you have to have a parenting plan. There are certain things because, you know, I think there's a part of me and, and our listeners, maybe he'll be like, but the hype, you know, my, my ex, he'll never do that. He's so high conflict. Like, how are we ever going to get 
to an agreed upon compromise. Um, and they don't, and I, you know, I know they think that can't happen, but you guys say it can, and it does. It does happen. Again, it does depend on the personality type. And there are certain personalities that refuse to get out of the me versus you power struggle. They just okay. are so stuck in that emotionally underdeveloped place from childhood due to their unresolved trauma that they cannot get out of that struggle. And usually this is deals more with the covert personality that's more coercive. Um, they are so stuck at being resentful and vengeful towards their co-parent that um, sometimes they're open to negotiating and finding solutions. And sometimes they are so rigid and black and white in their thinking patterns that you more or less just have to um, create boundaries for your own sense of safety and your own sense of like peace and well-being in terms of dealing with them. And it's not that we change the communication style in terms of how we deal with this specific type of personality. Um, we still stay outside of the power struggle, but you can just watch them continue to unravel because they're losing control usually over their co-parent is what's happening. Interesting. But I think now, too, it's Go ahead, please. I think it's also important to show, though, because if you do end up in court, you want to show that you tried to compromise, that you tried to be collaborative, and that you've done everything, and that, that allows the judge to see that you're trying to do what's in the best interest of the children, and so they can take those types of behavioral patterns into consideration when making their rulings and doing what's in the best interest of the child, but the more you take it, stay away from like the parent versus a parent and really focus on the children, the better off you're going to be. But like mm -hmm. I said, this is where we really help our clients document or do psychological analysis of the communications and reading through the lines and pulling out the patterns because it's, it becomes very obvious. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. And do you find, and this may not be um, true, but do you find that in high conflict situations, if the communication is more effective in writing than verbal, or does it really just depend? Oh, yes. Always. <laughs> I always use written communication with a high conflict co-parent, because the minute you try to have a verbal conversation with them, if you don't have a third party there witnessing what was said or documenting and sending an email update afterwards, they will... 100% change the whole entire narrative to fit their needs. And so, yes, always written communication with somebody of this nature. Oh, they'll say, I never agreed that. Like, mm -hmm. you must you must have mis oh. misunderstood me. Like, you know, that that's not true. And so, yeah, written communication is a must. Got it. Now, um, where, aside from having boundaries with your co-parent, where else should women have boundaries? Women should also have boundaries um, with themselves. Like, what do you need on a daily basis to fill up your own cup in order to be the best parent you can be? Like, what does that look like for you? Do you need to do some emotional regulation every morning or every night before you go to bed, such as journaling or deep breathing exercises? Do you need to go to the gym? What does that personal routine and boundaries look like for you in order to make sure that you feel the healthiest and most stable place that you can be to be the best parent? I also think too, like having personal boundaries or professional boundaries in your work life, trying, you know, especially when you do have your children during your parenting time and trying to be present for them because they only get one childhood and we don't want to necessarily have our thoughts or emotions in another place. So trying to be present and just honoring, you know, other relationships or friendships, whatever that may look like in maintaining those outside of your parenting time. So that way the children do get a fair chance and get your undivided attention. And you might have family boundaries too, like, you know, every Friday night you have, you know, movie and pizza night or something like that. You have family boundaries in order to connect and build trust. So there can be a wide range of boundaries that somebody puts in place and they might even have boundaries for the children. Um, we don't want to have rigid rules. I think that's a big misconception out there. Sometimes if you have rigid rules in your house for the mm -hmm. kids, that creates that black and white mentality that it's my way or the highway. And so we want to have boundaries within the household as well to help the children understand and then have integrity within their own responsibilities that they have to, whether it's doing their homework or chores or whatnot. Yeah, it can also be really helpful, especially with teenagers, too, as they're going through all those different 
you know, transitional phases and hormonal balances going, you know, through life and having boundaries with them and, you know, establishing those, what that looks like within the home, such as if they get their driver's license, how often do they get to drive the family car or um, how often do they get to stay over at a friend's house, things of that. So having those agreements shows respect for everyone within the household, but it also makes your life, you know, as a woman, as a mom, much easier to thrive because you feel like everyone's working collaboratively together and it's not about who's in charge or who's in the you know power seat because we like I said want children to learn their voice is powerful too. Now we recently had Beth Barrett on the show to talk about nesting, which is where during and after the divorce process the parents keep the family home and trade off. They they are the ones that come back and forth, you know, instead of the children. In this situation where couples may be sharing a space or still living together, how do you advise building and protecting your boundaries? That situation I would not recommend with a high conflict sort of situation. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very hard for parents to create their own stability when they're copying to come in and out of the family home and having their own safe space. Also, when you're dealing, if you are dealing with more of the covert personality, what happens is what I've seen is sometimes they will leave the house a complete disaster and then the other parent comes in, it's their turn for parenting the next week and they're left picking up the whole entire house and cleaning it because the other parent um, left it in a complete disarray. So I, it only works if there is going to be a high level of mutual respect within that dynamic and both parents are in a peaceful place where they're not looking to outdo one each other. They're not in a power struggle. There's just, it might work if you have two people that were best friends and are no longer in love, but there's just that respect of, you know, within the dynamic. Yeah, and I think you're right. It, it's uh, it, I was fascinated by that particular episode just because I began to look at it in a different way. But um, I think that was a big part of it. They had to have very clear boundaries and the mutual respect in order to make it work um, for them. Oh, yes, there would definitely be, have to be very clear boundaries. But again, it's like, I don't know how long sustainable that can be for even a parent if you're trying to have stability and start over in your life to have to come and go into the home like every other week or whatever the parenting arrangement might be because the parents need to have stability also in their life if their children are going to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I am still not really a proponent because in, in their her theory and the study was that it was just better for the kids. Why should the children have to go back and forth when we as adults made the decision to no longer live together? And then, but I don't know, it it it, it was it was an interesting thing. I I don't know if you guys have come across that very often. I think what's best is if you have two healthy parents who can really thrive during their parenting time and best support the children, whether that's two homes or one home, because it can also just be unhealthy for a child to be in that same home sometimes too and wonder why why one parent's not there and then the other parent comes in and the parents are switching. So that can also create instability for their child because they, they might think, well, what does, you know, a marriage look like or if they want to like with being role modeled to them in terms of love that a parent you know one partner can come and go as they please like it can also be confusing I think too for children to understand that dynamic I'm not saying you know it's and it's not that there might not be free of tension it, the children could still very well be stuck feeling in the middle or caught in the middle of their parents even mm -hmm. though the parents are like coming going so I really think it depends on the dynamic of the parents and the marriage and why it's ending or why they are um, no longer, you know, together. Now, um, with boundaries, they, it does sound like something that's very permanent, but I feel like in this conversation, I've learned, like, they're not necessarily set in stone, may or are, or are they? Maybe some are non-negotiable, but then others maybe can be fluid. 
Yes, some are not can be non-negotiable for your own sense of safety and protection. But then when it comes to co-parenting boundaries, you might renegotiate those depending on say the children are getting older and evolving, you know, so those uh, boundaries you set when the children were three may not work when the children are eight or 10. So they might, those dynamics might change and the boundaries might shift. Um, now we, we talked a little bit, but um, cause I think we were talking about, you know, with a boundary is not an ultimatum. Um, and what is the difference? And sometimes do you just have to have an ultimatum or is that usually not productive? I would try to work on setting a boundary first and boundaries like again, they promote, promote growth and it comes from a we mindset and it requires both people to communicate where the ultimatum comes from a me mindset and it's more or less a projection or a demand, which doesn't allow for collaboration. But the only time you would set an ultimatum is maybe you're being physically threatened or harassed right. or stopped, where mm -hmm. you have no choice besides to physically protect yourself. Yeah, more of a safety, in a safety situation, Correct. obviously. But um, yeah, I can see that because what you're trying to do with the boundaries and to promote so parenting is from that we mindset and that we are doing this together. Yeah. Um, you, I have, let's go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I was saying. You also that. might set unilateral boundaries when it comes to maybe someone being sober, but why they have the children. So sobriety issues. So mm -hmm. I would say anything that comes down to safety or if there would be child endangerment, then there would be hard lines. Yeah. And I can, and that makes sense obviously in, in those situations, right? Yeah, that has to be a non you know, an ultimatum type thing because of the mm -hmm. safety of the children or yourself. Um, now, Jan and Jillian, this has been a great conversation. I know that our listeners uh, certainly are benefiting and love this, but um, I can't believe we're, we're practically out of time. But before we go, I'd love to hear from each of you, if you'd like, um, you know, what you've learned about women and their resilience throughout your careers and experience? Well, I would say women are strong. They do have the power to change their life around and get out of these toxic situations that are no longer healthy for them. And they find their new um, inner voice and their new strength when they do have the ability to believe in themselves and start learning how powerful their voice really is and the type of person that they've been dealing with and how it comes full circle and they no longer allow that person to trigger them anymore and they're able to stay outside of it. So all of our clients that come to us for coaching get to that place. And I think too, for women in general, you know, we have this like inner strength, this emotional resilience. And we have to see that this chapter of our life sometimes is no longer meant for us. It's time for us to grow. It's time to evolve and start a life that is actually truly aligned to who we want to be, who we are, and what that those values are. So we learn through our own lessons in life that sometimes it's a bigger blessing to start fresh and new and not let your past dictate your present life or your future. I love that. That is, um, that's so very true. Um, that is great. Um, and lastly, where can our listeners find you for more information and resources? Yeah, they can find us at divorcefamilymediations.com and they can check out our book, Boundary Badass, is available on Amazon. Great. And we will absolutely have those in our show notes. And um, what area, are you able to mediate anywhere or do you have any restrictions? We, no, we actually do mediate um, globally. So in regards to all of our parenting plans. Wonderful. Well, that is great to know. Um, and we have reached the end of our show today. Thank you so much, Jan and Jillian Newhouse, for joining us to discuss boundaries, co-parenting with a toxic ex, and their boundary badass method. Thanks, Thanks for you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. It's been great. And listeners, if you or someone you know is going through a divorce or is thinking about a divorce in the Northeast Florida area, please reach out to us at floridawomenslawgroup.com and you will find the link in the episode description as well as how to get in touch with Jan and Jillian. Thank you so much for listening.